So this lecture is on solar energy. So again, the sun's core temperature is very hot um, and it actually is a very high pressure. And this high temperature and high pressure is from nuclear fusion. So basically two neutrons and two protons um, combine to form a helium and light, which produces this high temperature, high pressure conditions. Again, this nuclear fusion is where you have smaller masses go into a larger mass, which releases this energy. And it's actually a more efficient energy production than fission, which is where we get nuclear energy from that we use for electricity production. So the sun generates almost four to the 10 to the 23rd kilowatts of energy daily. Um, of that, again, only um, a less, less, a little more than half of that actually reaches um, the Earth's surface, about 800,000 times 10 to the 12 watts, sorry, a lot less than half of the watts instead of kilowatts, um, reaches the Earth's surface. So again, that would be about um, um, eight times 10 to the 12 um, kilowatts that reach the Earth's surface, which is about 10,000 times the global energy demand. Four-fifths of the sun output falls on the ocean, which drives the water cycle. Again, evaporation causes rain, which again is a hydropower resource, and about one-fifth falls, falls on land, um, which is still 2,000 times greater than our total energy demand. And again, we can capture this energy versus, um, using a variety of solar technologies, which, we will, which I will describe now. Um, so just to make sure we're clear though, though on the nuclear, on the solar radiation, um, again, the, this radiant energy, this light that comes from the sun is an electromagnetic radiation. Um, half of it is in the visible spectrum, so this is here in the visible spectrum, but the other half is mainly in the near infrared spectrum of light. So there's various factors affecting solar radiation, clouds, aerosol, the distance to the earth, the tilt, the time of the day, the time of the year, the latitude, as well as the transparency of the earth's surface that it's hitting. So again, if we think about solar radiation coming, again, there's gonna be a larger distance um, based on where you are in, um, in the Earth. Um, so about 1300 watts per meter square in areas directly facing the sun, where we are in the Northern Hemisphere, it's close to about 1000 watts per meter squared. Um, but again, the global average is about 340 because half is tilted because of the angle. But then we also have dispersion from water, from clouds, from ice, as well as aerosols that are in the atmosphere. So again, when we look at solar energy transfer, there's three things we need to be aware of, radiation, conduction, and convection. Basically, heat in is heat out. And so if we think about conduction, when you heat a metal strip at one end, the heat's going to travel through um, molecular contact. So the outer electrons of metal atoms drift and are free to move. So as you heat the metal, those, those um, particles vibrate, they gain kinetic energy, and these vibrations make the adjacent particles vibrate and transfer the energy across the metal, which we call conduction. Now we have insulators such as wood or plastic that don't have those outer electrons, which is why they don't conduct heat as well as metals. And then we have convection. So when we heat particles in a liquid or gas, the particles spread out and become less dense and transfer the heat through this fluid motion. So the fluid, mo the fluid movement is the convection transfer of heat. So liquids that are hotter and less dense, they'll rise, and then the cooler ones sink, which distributes the heat much more efficiently, actually, than would occur through conduction only. So when we talk about heat loss, again, it depends on conduction, convection, and radiation. It depends on the temperature difference, the area, and the U-value. So again, in your book, there's a whole section on U-value and heat loss. There's actually a box that kind of explains it. So make sure you do go over understanding U-value. So if we look at the windows that we have in our own houses, if you have a single glaze, your watts per meter square per Kelvin is going to be much higher than if you have a triple gazing, for example. So that U-value is, um, is, again, the heat flow per square metered. Um, equals the U value times the temperature difference. So again, if you have, you're going to have less um, heat going through a triple glazing than you are a single glazing. 
So when we look specifically at solar um, collectors, they allow sunlight in, but they don't allow sunlight out. They absorb the sunlight and they transfer this energy to a fluid that's running through the convection, the collector using both conducts, um, conduction and convection. And the idea is to lose as little heat as possible through convection. So when we look at the amount that eats that that reaches the earth's surface at a specific time again it's dependent both on the position of the sun and the atmospheric conditions so when it's directly overhead the sky is clear that radiation is going to be about a thousand watts per meter squared that's our average and so this is the highest value the highest average value that we're going to get without mirrors or lenses it's about a thousand watts per meter squared but again it really depends on where it is in the, in, the, in the sky. So when it's at its zenith, so the zenith is when it's directly overhead, we're gonna get more sunlight passing through than when it's not directly overhead because then it has to pass through more atmosphere. So you're gonna get more spreading. So you're gonna have less watts per meter squared actually hitting your solar collector. So again, here's the sun at zenith and then we can look at the angle away from the zenith. Um, and how much more atmosphere it needs to go through at any given path. So before we look specifically at active solar collection, where we actually collect it in the solar, in the solar cells, um, we can look at passive solar. And so when we're looking at passive solar, um, there is a, um, there is a conservatory, which basically, um, the conservatory is, is gonna take this, um, preheats the air through like a greenhouse and creates a thermal mask here. And then the warm air can then go into the house and then the air would flow out normally. Um, a trome wall is similar, but instead of it being a one flow in, we're actually going to have a double flow where we actually have and the glass here and the warm air comes in and the cool air comes back out to be heated again. You can also just have um, direct gain by windows. So again, normally what you'll do is you'll have um, where you want to heat um, the building using light. You actually can change the slats and the way the building slats are. And um, during the summer, because the sun is more overhead, um, the overhang will reduce the amount of, of, of heat energy that comes in. But during the winter, when the sun is lower in the profile, then that, that um, heat gain is more realized when you want it. And so overhanging is a great way to have direct gain of solar energy in, this, in the winter when you need it. So again, when we look at passive solar heating, there's kind of five different things that we look at. You look at whatever your collector is, so whether it's a window, a conservatory, a trome wall, um, your thermal mass that's being heated. And so you might even have like water in here. The idea of having a thermal mass of water is that it can actually absorb um, that solar energy and then it lets it out more slowly. And so you continue, for example, overnight to get that heat gain. And then you're gonna have some sort of distribution through conduction, convection inside the house. Um, and then you're gonna have some kind of control, which could be again, this overhang that's gonna stop the summer sun from coming in, but allow the winter sun to come in. Again, in peak chapter three on passive solar technologies and insulation, it's thoroughly covered. So again, there's different types of active solar gain. So instead of passive solar gain, which is what we just talked about, this is active gain. In, in this lecture, we're only gonna talk about five of the six of these. Um, there's the solar pond, the photovoltaic, which we're not going to discuss, the solar chimney, the parabolic trough, the solar towers, as well as the parabolic dishes. So the first thing you do when you're interested in any of these active solar heating is looking at tracking the sun. And so you can actually use um, programs now um, on your computer. It used to be we would get these um, solar pathfinders and you can still use those, which are a little globe. And basically they map out where the sun is gonna be from December, from, you know, December, from the winter through the summer and during every time of the day. And so what they're looking at is what that path is. So then you can figure out where you would wanna put your, um, 
your panel or whatever it is that you're trying to use your solar collector. And also look at any overhangs that might need to be removed because they would be shading that collector. Also, depending on the tilt of your collector. So in the, um, in the winter, a more vertical position would be better versus in, this, in the summer, you want something that tilts a little bit more. Um, so normally what we do is we do a tilt equal to the latitude because that's gonna give the best performance in the spring and the autumn and then good performance in the winter and um, the summer. And so normally, again, your tilt is gonna be equal to the latitude. So normally our, in the Northern Hemisphere, our, our panels are gonna face due south, plus or minus 30 degrees. Um, 30 degrees, and that gives us the maximum sun exposure, especially during the peak hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And again, we're going to reduce shadings from buildings, mountains, other obstructions, trees from about three hours before and three hours after solar noon. So solar noon is different than noon on our clocks. Solar noon is the midpoint between the time of sunrise and sunset. So solar noon is going to change um, throughout the seasons, it can change, but again, it's that midpoint between sunrise and sunset is solar noon. So we want to think about obstructions three hours before and three hours after and to eliminate those to get the best gain on our solar collectors. So if we look specifically at solar thermal, and so that's what we're mainly going to discuss today and as opposed to PV, solar photovoltaic. So looking at solar thermal, again, the average annual sun hours per day is going to be highest here in the southeast. So that means these are the sun hours um, between solar noon and after solar noon where we're going to get good um, heating. And again, where we are in Maryland, we get about 4.5, anywhere from 4 to 4.5 um, sun hours per day. So, um, and here in the, in the west, we have about six hours and in Alaska only average of three hours. Again, that's because of the, um, in the winter, they hardly have any solar um, annual sun hours. So when we look at extracting temperature from the ground, we're looking at anywhere from 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so that would be your geothermal. If we're doing water heating, we want it to be about 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, if we're looking at it for industry, 200 to 400, and solar thermal power, power plants, which we'll discuss, have over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. So again, when we're looking at heating performance, as we said, we're going to be focusing on the West, but really they can be used anywhere um, for a solar collector. Again, if we're going to use a glycol system, we can use um, those systems or we can use a vacuum system and I'll discuss what those are. Um, the most um, solar heater collectors global capacity is actually in China by far, 71%, um, while the rest of the world has about 10%. Um, um, excluding the United States, Germany, and Turkey, which have about three and four percent each. So solar thermal systems, um, when we specifically are looking at solar thermal like residential systems, for example, they're categorized by the reflector types. So um, normally you would have nothing that just um, uses a, a no lens, a flat mirror, a parabolic shape, um, a spherical shape, so we're gonna go through all of these. We'll start with the none. Um, so this is just a passive um, solar thermal hot water system. So it's basically gonna provide domestic um, or you know, for building hot water. And basically what happens is it offsets heating costs for the building, the laundromat, a swimming pool, um, and it's adapted to, uh, to, to go into, it can be used for radiant heating, um, it can also be used for hot water heating. And so we'll go through this system. So basically what you have is some sort of glazing. You have an absorber plate, and then you have insulation on the bottom so that you're um, keeping that heat energy inside the collector. So again, um, unglazed, it's just gonna have water coming through and a black absorber. So this is gonna give you anywhere from a 10 to zero to 10 degrees Celsius, so a larger rise in Fahrenheit, um, going through your system. Um, you can also have a flat plate with air, so the air actually flows through there, and that, then that hot air can then be used um, for heating inside the home. Um, you also can have a flat plate with, with um, water, 
And then finally, you can have an evacuated tubes. And again, it used to be 10 years ago, the flat plate with water or glycol. Um, glycol would be used so it wouldn't freeze, were more common. Now, most of them are gonna be these evacuated tubes because again, it's much more efficient with the evacuated tubes. You get less heat loss, so you get more um, heat gain. And so here, we have our evacuated glass tube, and then we have again, our heat condenser pipe here that is heated. So our four main components, so again, first we have our collector. So this is again, solar thermal, so it's not a PV. It looks different than a PV, but when exposed to the sunlight, this is gonna get hot, okay? And then again, this heat transfer, and when you touch it, it's actually quite hot. Um, it can burn you depending on um, the time of day and the type of system used. Um, the heat transfer fluid passes through these collectors or evacuated tubes, um, and it's going to absorb heat. Then, if we look at again that evacuated tube, just so that we're clear. So you have some kind of absorber sheet. So instead of it being a glycol tube in the middle, it's gonna be a heat pipe that's basically a glass tube on the outside with a high vacuum. So again, we're not gonna lose um, any of our heat. Once it's heated, that heat pipe is going to um, condense with our heat exchanger and then we'll have the glycol liquid, the, the glycol or the water, depending on where you are if you freeze. Um, going to wherever we're going to use it. So after our solar collector, we have our line set. Our line set actually carries this heat transfer fluid, as I said, from the collectors to the energy pack and back. So if it's set inside a building, um, it could be shorter and lose less heat. If it's outside a building for a longer period of time, for a longer length, then um, we should make sure that we have insulation around so we don't lose the heat um, before it gets into where we're going to use it. Finally, we have an energy pack and that's actually going to use an electric pump, which is going to circulate the heat transfer fluid through this closed loop. So we're going to constant, depending on the temperature, it's controlled, the energy pack's controlled by the temperature. When it gets hot enough, we'll then um, run the heat from the, um, the fluid from the collector into where we're going to use it. And then the cold, the closed loop, so the cold water would go back to be heated again. And then finally, we have our, our solar storage tank. So this is where the working fluid releases the heat to the hot water. So often it's plumbed in series with the original hot water heater. So what that means is you have your solar collector here, you have your hot water coming here, and you have your heat exchanger. And what you can have is either two different um, tanks or one tank in which you also might have your conventional hot water heater, your boiler. And so maybe this gets it almost all the way to where we want it. And then that way our boiler only has to work for a little bit to get it to the temperature that we want for our showers, for example. Um, in warmer climates, you can have what you call a thermosiphon unit where it places the storage tank above the, above the solar unit. So again, the hot water rises in and the cooler water returns to the bottom. Here we don't need that energy pack, that heat pump to circulate the water because again, the convection properties are going to circulate those waters, um, get the cold water down here and return the hot water to your hot water tank that you can then use. We can also have a kind of a, a solar district heating system where we can use it in both in radiant floors and showers and you have a central storage tank where again, all of the cold water comes here and the hot water then is distributed through the buildings and the residential homes. So that's kind of your, your, without concentrating, we just have a glaze panel and we're just going to get the heat um, that, that strikes that surface. Now we're gonna talk about concentrating solar power. So we concentrate it, we're either gonna concentrate it to a point, we're gonna concentrate it to a line, so we might have a precise point as they do in a solar tower, you might have a line as they do in a parabolic trough, or you might have a specific point focus as we do in the Stirling engines. Um, where we have mirrors and a point focus. So, um, and this pipe that's in the middle can be vacuum or glass covered. It can have oil or water inside, depending on the technology that's being used. So specifically for the parabolic trough collectors, 
So this large array is actually going to have gaps in between. You can see the shadow here. So we need to make sure that the shadow from one does not um, shadow the next one behind it. So you actually have this trough system. Um, so the flexible pipe circulates this thermal oil. Often it's oil um, because oil can heat faster than water. And this oil is going to be circulated throughout this trough. And then it's going to go to this back control building in the background. And so basically what what we do is you can move this from um, it's not going to go it's just basically going to kind of track the sun so that we are constantly so here the sun's over here so we track the sun um, and so these actually do move as the sun moves so here we can see in the morning here's our line focus Again, so in the morning, we're collecting all of this, and then the afternoon, our line focusing collector with, again, single axis tracking will still be tracking, but at a different tilt. So what this does is you have the trough and you have your heat transfer unit. So just like your solar collectors, where you have your heat transfer and then it goes to a heat exchanger, um, the difference being with this one, instead of just using it for hot water, because we can get much higher, um, temperature with the parabolic trough with the line focus because we have the mirror focusing that so instead of it just being a few degrees it can be many more degrees and we can actually use it for um, for electricity generation and so we're going to use these troughs to then um, often we still will need additional heating but the difference being instead of running our coal fire power plant our natural gas power plant for electricity production all the time we may just need to run it a little bit because we've already heated the water um, through the parabolic trough system so then we can do our turbine generator just like we would produce electricity using coal or natural gas but we don't only need to use a little bit of that um, Again, the sun changing position requires the moving parts and focus. So again, the solar um, noon um, changes as the sun changes throughout the year. We do have to move them and they cause power to move them. But again, we're creating electricity, creating power from it. Um, you do need to worry about the sail area. Um, you need to worry about um, high winds. And so you can actually kind of stow them down when the weather um, is bad. So the next, um, Technology, so this is now a different technology. So instead of it being a, a trough, now we're talking about a power tower. So instead of each of these, um, instead of each of these having a line and having liquid in this, this is only going to be mirrors. There's no liquid running inside of it. And what they do is the mirrors are going to reflect the the solar energy to a central receiver and so they're aimed to focus at a specific target and they move in that target and that target actually melts salt and the mirrors are about 10 square feet and they're mounted kind of on um, just antenna basically antenna mounts and then they're about 10 feet off the ground and they're just going to track the sun and they're going to focus the sun right in this power tower and so what happens is um, here's our sunlight coming in and here's our energy. So as the sun starts to shine, our energy gets stored. And the reason why we use salt instead of the oil is the salt holds the energy for longer. So again, if we think about the time of day, we use a lot of energy. Here's 8 a.m. in the morning. But by 6 p.m., we're still using energy even though the sun's going down. So this allows us to have a more constant output power um, later in the afternoon when we're still using a lot of energy. And um, by having that kind of, so basically we're using salt, we're heating up that salt, and then we're using that salt to make electricity, just like we would other, um, through other means. And finally, a solar pond, where basically we have fresh water floating on top of salt water, and the solar heating of the brine raises its temperature. And then we have a Rankine cycle engine, um, which turns a generator to, so this is smaller, so this is going to be like 70 kilowatts. So this isn't going to be the massive solar tower amount of electricity coming out, but it is good for small um, applications. And then the Stirling engine. So these are actually going to be um, more modulated. So the solar tower is just one tower. We're bringing everything to a central location. With this one, it's more module, so it acts more like solar PV in that way. But the difference being, again, this is not a PV system. This is still back to a mirror system. And so what this is, is we take the mirrors, again, it brings it to a single focus, and a Stirling engine actually converts this heat energy to mechanical power. It has a fixed quantity of air 
um, or gas inside of the engine and it basically heats that and it goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, the engine does, which creates that same, we talked about the um, generator turning, right? With this, it's a back and forth motion through the heating, cooling, heating, cooling, and that Stirling engine goes back and forth and creates electricity that way. And so again, here's different types of Stirling engines, different types of reflectors, which again, each one of these is gonna have its own small engine. So each engine is only about 10 to 25 kilowatts. But again, these engines, we can have 10 systems, we can have 100 systems. So it's more module in nature. Um, and the Stirling engine is actually very efficient um, with transferring that heat energy into electricity. And then finally, we have our sun cooker. Um, so we can also just cook directly using these mirrors. Um, and again, the whole idea is that we're concentrating the sunlight to a central point so we can actually boil water with it if you've ever tried to make, make fire using a, um, using a magnifying glass. It's the same idea that you're concentrating it to a single point um, to allow um, the heat to be concentrated. And so you can also just heat something directly using solar energy. So thank you very much. That's our solar energy lecture.